You are tuned in to your weekly Sunday morning word broadcast, Rhema Power, with Reverend Nee Bernard Adiakwa, Senior Pastor of Powerhouse Ministries International, a program designed to improve your understanding into the Word of God, bring you practical solutions, and empower you to rise above life's daily challenges. Stay tuned. Hello, precious one. We wish to extend a warm invitation to you to join us for any of our Sunday services at the PMI King's Temple. Our services are specially designed to specifically meet your needs and draw you closer to have fellowship with God in His presence. You are welcome to join us in person at 6.15 a.m. for the morning glory service, at 7.30 a.m. for the second service, which is also streamed live across all our social media platforms, and at 9.45 a.m. for the third service. We also wish to invite you to join us for the Living Mana, a weekday Bible teaching service, which comes off every Tuesday at 6 p.m. and Thursday at 6.30 p.m. in person and online, respectively. On Fridays, we gather before our Father's altar at 6 p.m. to pray and seek His face for divine encounters. The King has a special place for you. Don't come alone. You surely will be blessed by the Word of God. In Jesus' name, God richly bless you. No matter the position you occupy, stand as a priest of God. Let the righteousness of God prevail. Be a channel of God's blessings. Never lose your priesthood. Never. You may be powerful on this earth. You may have a lot of authority on this earth. Never lose your relationship with God. So you see Melchizedek, who is a king on earth, but a priest to God. Then you see Abraham, who also has wealth and is powerful on this earth, but is also a priest to God. You know, there's a kind of unfortunate thinking that once I begin to become powerful on earth, I don't need God. Once I finish school and I have money, no, I don't need to serve God. But in the first two instances, we are seeing Melchizedek, we are seeing Abraham. Very powerful on earth, very godly, very spiritual. Presidents can serve the Lord. Heads of states must serve the Lord. CEOs, assemblymen, chiefs. The more God blesses us, the more we serve. The choir is not for people who are not blessed. Prayer words is not for people who are not blessed. You see, the more, the more you are blessed, the more you draw closer to God. The more you function as a priest. And I want to place this demand on all of you. God is lifting us up. God is building us up. God is promoting us. The blessings of elevation. Remember the Lord your God. Serve him. And use whatever privilege he has given you to serve him. I want to see managing directors who are ashes. I want to see presidents who are in the choir. Who are excited about blessing the name of the Lord. I want to see owners of factory and uh, judges and lawyers and, and supreme court judges serving the Lord. Don't ever let any position or privilege take you away from God. So in presenting the tithe to Melchizedek, Abraham acknowledges the exclusive supremacy of God whom Melchizedek worshipped and of the authority and the validity of the priesthood that he exercised. He acknowledged that the God of Melchizedek was his God. So by acknowledging Melchizedek, he was also acknowledging the God of Melchizedek. I know why I'm saying all this. Is. They are the foundation for you to understand clearly the position of a man of God. In relating with a man of God, you are also acknowledging his God. So by Abraham acknowledging Melchizedek, okay, he was also acknowledging that we serve the same God. The same God who had continued to reveal himself to Abraham since the journey of his faith was also the God of Melchizedek. So Melchizedek is referred to as the king of righteousness. Very important. He shows us that the one who receives the tithe or the offerings receives it with integrity and he uses it righteously. Melchizedek cannot capriciously squander what he has received to feed his own greed. So the person you are going to relate with is a person of integrity. It's a person of righteousness. Important foundations for a man of God. Not a title because he's representing God. So we see in the Old Testament, this becomes the foundation of people that are referred to as men of God. All of them stand in this uniquely privileged position with integrity and righteousness and not a gift. So when you talk about somebody who is a man of God, two things, what are they? Integrity, righteousness. He's a king of Salem. He's a priest of the Most High God. So let's come to the New Testament. John chapter 1 verse 6. In the New Testament, we are introduced to a man sent from God. 
John chapter 1 verse 6, there was a man sent from God. What was his name? John. This is a mystery on earth. Although we are all born of human beings and live on earth, the Bible is acknowledging that there are some that are sent with a divine mandate by God. They are on a divine assignment and mission with and for God. What? There's a man. So all of us are living on this earth. But the Bible identifies one man and says that this man is not ordinary. He was sent from God. He has a divine mandate. He may be one of us here, but no, 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 no. He is sent from God. Your life on earth is going to be directly impacted by how you identify and relate with them, either for good or for bad. If you treat them well, God will treat you well. So when I read this verse, there was a man sent from God. I ask myself, and I'm, I'm going to be careful because who is sitting by me that I don't know but has been sent by God? Am I going to identify him by his dressing? Because John's dressing is nothing. Am I going to identify him by his looks? Am I going to identify him by his educational background? What school did he go to? Am I going to identify him by his house? Where does he stay? Deserts. What does he eat? Locusts and wild honey. The guy doesn't look like a man of God. <laughs> But the Bible tells us there was a man sent from God. His name was John. So how many of you, if you ever met John, would recognize him? In fact, people met Jesus Christ. They didn't even recognize him. He came unto his own. His own received him not. Why? The carpenter's son. You thought that a man of God would be a lawyer's son or a politician's son, but carpenter's son. He learned carpentry as a trade. He wasn't liked by people, but he was sent from God. So when I share with you on the encounter with men of God or mystery with men of God, may God open our eyes and may God help us when we meet them to identify them and also to be able to relate well with them. Because there's a direct correlation between the way you relate with him and how God will relate with you. Matthew chapter 10, verse 40 and 41. Look at what it says. Very interesting. And I want all of us to read it together. One, two, go. He that receiveth you, receiveth me. And he that receiveth me, receiveth him that sent me. Verse 41. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man. What is the key word there? Receive. So there are righteous men, there are prophets. If I can identify and receive them, I will also get a prophet's reward and a righteous man's reward. So there are things you can pray for. But you see, it, it doesn't just take prayer. It answers to your reception. You must be able to receive. You, you cannot be indifferent. You cannot ignore. You cannot be like a discount. You must learn to receive the prophet and the righteous man. And immediately the Bible said you will get a reward. You will do what? Get a reward. Your assignment is to find them and help them on life's journey. These are people who pay a great price with their lives, if you want to identify them. Their life is a life of great personal sacrifice, and it stands for God. Some of them live under a pledge or a vow. Some of them live in wilderness and caves, and have separated themselves to live a fasted life of waiting on the Lord. Some of them have paid the price of separating away from family and friends, and their comfort zones, denying themselves the pleasures of this world, to know and serve God, and they are often in much confrontation with the world and their standards. So look at Abraham, the father of our faith. God calls him and says, leave your family, leave your mother, leave your kindred, leave your tribe, and go. Just leave them. So when you find men of God, they're usually separated, and sometimes they pay a great price. You know, sometimes you don't even know their brothers and their sisters. It looks like they are, they are born alone. They're also born into a family, but they have moved away. It's as if they don't have friends. They don't, they don't associate with anybody. Because they pay a price. You cannot be in the world and be around the world. And every time you see a man of God, he's paid a great price to be who he is. Look at John the Baptist living in caves. His cousin was Jesus. Living in caves, in tents, in wilderness. And every time he came to town, there was confusion. To a point where Herod now killed him. We can talk about Jeremiah. We can talk about Elijah. We can talk about Elisha. Look at the separation denials. So as we have previously learned, there are three major characteristics that qualify men of God according to Timothy. Establishing them as men of integrity and righteousness. Number one, they flee the love of money. Money is not what they are looking for. A lot of people who are ordinary are working for money, but men of God 
money is not the issue. They are not working for money. They are working for God. And they don't care if they hustle. Number two, they pursue righteousness. And number three, they earnestly contend for the faith and are often ready to defend the faith with their lives. So when people are getting comfortable and arguments are coming about a lot of things that are wrong, men of God will stand up and speak. So look at Luke chapter 13 verse 34 and see what the Bible says about the prophets or the men of God that he sends and the reaction of the world. May God open our eyes to encounter and receive them. So in Luke chapter 13 verse 34, what does it say? Oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killeth the prophets and stoneth them that are sent unto thee. So what is Jerusalem's attitude? Every time a prophet comes into their lives, what do they do? They stone them. Can you imagine? They actually take stones and they throw at a man of God. (laughs) And they kill them. Murder. Murder. It shows you that people who are prophets of God, sometimes they can attract so much negativity and hatred. What is he doing? He's not taking you to a disco. He's not taking you to a nightclub. He's not taking you to a beach. What's he doing? He's just talking about the faith. He has a life that he's not looking for money. He's establishing righteousness. He has integrity. And yet, look at the reaction of the world. They stone. You see, because sometimes, men of God can, by their appearance, intimidate or you can somehow see your sinful state when they appear. So there's hatred to a point where, then let, let him go away. You can be in school and somebody's creepy. And then the person comes around and he's blowing tongues and it's like every being is praying, oh, let him go. He, who is he? He thinks he's better than us. See, that's the kind of reaction. But it shows you qualifications of somebody who's a man of God. I know that some of you, you like popularity. You can't stand up for the truth. You want to be accepted by all your friends. So your creepy is nice. But, uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. And this is what the Bible says. They are hated. That's why every time John the Baptist came to preach, he ran away back into the wilderness. Because if he stayed long enough, they'll kill him. And he'll be telling you the truth. And he'll be saying things that sometimes cut you. But it's too noon. Oh, don't mind him. They are all hypocrites. He thinks he's better than us. That's the reaction. And so every time God said somebody, righteousness, integrity, somebody who will defend the faith, the Pharisees are preaching something. He'll come and say, no, this is not it. There's a, a lifestyle that is going. I mean, they are pushing it down. And says, no. And then the whole gay community with their money, they want to eliminate him because he's a stumbling block to righteousness. So what do you stand for? You see, the fact that you have a title of a pastor does not mean you're a man of God. And I'm coming to that. Because being a man of God, you will fight things that people don't normally fight. And you pay a great price. And when you speak, people may not like you, but they will listen and say that this guy is sound. And he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you kill the prophets and stone them that are sent unto you. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you didn't allow me? Wow. Verse 35. And he says, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And verily I say unto you, you shall not see me. You shall not see who? God. God is saying, you shall not see me until the time comes when you shall say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Huh? So how is God revealed? A man of God will come your way. And when you see him, then God says, you will see me. Wow. So look at Abraham. Melchizedek comes. If he hadn't received Melchizedek, something would have been blocked. You see, so... It says, till you learn how to say it, your house will remain desolate. So there are houses that are desolate. When they say desolate, it means it's empty, it's barren, it's unfruitful, it's dry. It's not flourishing. Why? Because there's a certain mystery that must be unveiled. And it's not unveiled. The mystery of the man of God. And we'll show you in the Bible. It says, unless you shall see, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. I told you, he that receiveth you, receiveth me. So what is your reception to be? Receive the Lord. How do you receive the Lord? Receive the one he sends. May God help us. May God help me. John chapter 1 verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Verse 12. But as many as received him, as many as did what? Received him. May God help us to identify and receive them. God had sent somebody in the world, another man of God, somebody standing in his place. But look at the reaction of the world. They received him not. But as many as received him, as many as received him, to them gave he power. So the power of God follows your reception. So if you never learn how to receive, there'll be no power to make you become. It says that to them that received him, you see, they are born ordinary and they mingle with the world. 
but they are on a divine mission. They know, the men of God, they know and carry a sense of destiny and purpose with them. And the difficult thing is that many people who have grown up with them, because they were so born, they lived around you. They've been born, they've grown up with you to accept the transition that one day somebody I was sending around, somebody who was my schoolmate, somebody who was living in the same environment with me, all of a sudden has grown up from an ordinary person into becoming a prophet or a man of God. Somebody you know, his name was John. You were growing up with him. You played chaskele with him. You went to school with him. You were better than him. You knew his parents and everything. All of a sudden, the person is now a man of God. And it's not easy because you, you have a lot of things about his past. But in the midst of that, may God open our eyes to identify and to receive him. And now, today's message. You need to understand the environment in which Jesus Christ was growing. Before he started working, there were the Pharisees, there were the scribes, there were the learned men. All of a sudden, you come back and say, you're a Messiah. Some people may leave him. And you find in the Bible, some people left. Some people couldn't follow him. Some people, all their lives were trying to kill him. Because God had sent a man of God, a prophet. But the people were still caught in the past. And some of you, maybe, that's why you are afraid to become a pastor. Because Alebu, somebody will trace your family history. Somebody will tell you when you were born. And how he used to give you meat and toffee. And now look at you. But it's part of it. You grow. Genesis chapter 48, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick. Joseph's father was who? Jacob. So somebody came and told Joseph, Behold, your father Jacob is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, who were his grandchildren. Look at verse 12, verse 2. And I want you to look at it really carefully. One to go. And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee. And Israel strengthened himself and sat on the bed. Who was Jacob? Joseph's father. Naturally, he was Joseph's father. What was wrong with his father? His father was sick. Jacob, Joseph's father, is sick. Natural biological relationship. But when one told Jacob, another person came and said, Jacob, your son is coming. Because that's what they know him. But immediately, the Bible says that he sat upon the bed and he strengthened himself. And his name is changed from Jacob to Israel. He's no longer your earthly father. He's no longer somebody you've biologically and humanly grown up with. He has a spiritual weight and position that is beyond your earthly knowledge of him. And what he says can change your life forever. Physically, you know him as Jacob. You've grown up with him as Jacob. You've seen him cheat people and run away from his house and be changed, chased by everybody. But when he heard it, the Bible said Israel strengthened himself because something is about to happen that will change the course of history. You see, one of the things that you all face about men of God is their natural and then their spiritual positions. And sometimes, when you relate very naturally with people, they cannot receive you spiritually. And that is why many times, men of God move away from people to help them. Because the more familiar you are with people, the more they undermine your spiritual authority. So, you don't feel the anointing when he's praying for you again. Because you chat with him, you eat with him, you laugh with him. But when you don't know somebody, and he comes and says, lift up your hand, he's praying for you. There's more faith because you don't know him. Israel strengthened himself and sat on the bed. You've been told your son is coming with his grandchildren. And he says, ah, 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 this is a moment of destiny. There's a spiritual authority that overrides who I am. One of the interesting things is for my wife to come and kneel down and give me an offering or to ask me to pray for her. One of the things is for me to get one of my classmates or somebody who just recognize that ah, ah, I'm not just your classmate and let me pray for you. Let me instruct you. Not everybody handles that well. And sometimes in your own church, because they've seen you maybe unhappy or angry or broke or tired or something, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country. When you go to another country, oh, Charlie, <laughs> anointing just the flow. People are writing notes. People are buying tapes. People are, they want to have appointments with you. Why? Because they don't know and they haven't grown up with you. They only know you as Israel. They called him Jacob, but he was Israel. Let's look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 53. All these are foundations just to help you relate well and to be able to receive the next stage of your future matthew chapter 13 from verse 53 and let's all read it together and it came to pass when jesus had finished these parables he departed thence and when he was coming to his own country he taught them in their synagogue where was he in his own country he taught them in their synagogue in so much that they were astonished what that guy could check word he taught them so much that they were astonished and then they said whence had this man this wisdom and these mighty works 
They recognized that the guy was speaking a lot of wisdom and his works were mighty. But look at the next verse. Look at the next verse, verse 55. Immediately, is this not the carpenter's son? You see again, they were now going to reduce him from the mighty and great works and the wisdom. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is his mother not called Mary? Don't we know how he was born and there was so much controversy? Are his brothers not James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Don't we know him? They will mention all your relatives' names. And look at verse 56. And his sisters, are they not all with us? How come this man has all these things? Verse 57. And they were offended in him. This is somebody who had preached parables. This is somebody who had taught in the, and brought wisdom. And they were like, wow. All of a sudden, oh, that guy, we know him. We know his brothers. We know how he was born. Anytime you are growing and you start hearing people talking like this, move away. Because they're about to stop you from a blessing. Because they don't want you to continue receiving. Because something is going to be released as many as received him. So this kind of conversation is actually going to stop your reception. Who doesn't have faults? Who doesn't have a, a childhood? Who never made mistakes? The doctors who do operations, didn't they make mistakes? The lawyers who are in the courtroom, didn't they make mistakes? The Supreme Court judge, didn't he make mistakes? The president of the country, didn't he make mistakes when he was a child? Well, all of them, their mistakes didn't matter. But a man of God, all of a sudden, they were offended because the guy has wisdom. They were offended, but Jesus said unto them, True, a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country. You see, one of the things a church must learn to do is to receive the man of God with honor. The word honor means a lot of high respect. Because without that, you will not be able to receive. What allows you to receive is honor. That in your heart, there is a heart of honoring this guy. You've recognized that this is a man sent from God. His name is John. Others don't see, but God has opened your eyes to see. And as many as received him, to them gave he power. So there are things we begin to learn to do that will always allow us to receive. Otherwise, in his own country, in his own church, look at verse 58. Look at the sad part of verse 58. One, two, go. Who? Who is he talking about? Is his name Jesus? Is he the word of God? By him all things were made, and without him was not anything made that was made. And yet, amongst a certain group of people, he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. The same Jesus Christ, in a particular environment, stopped working because no honor. All they could find about him was his childhood and his background, and they could only find fault. Let me just teach you a few things. Jesus Christ, his friend Lazarus died. Martha and Mary's brother. Martha and Mary were two women who had served Jesus Christ for four days after Lazarus' death. Jesus didn't appear. Eh? I've worked with Jesus Christ. Uh, look at him. He, 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 he won't come. I've sent for him and nobody knows where he is. He hasn't even called me. As for Jesus, says, you are following Christ. He's a waste of time. And I can imagine the relatives of Martha and Mary. Ah, are you saying that since your brother died, Jesus hasn't even called you and he hasn't come up? The one you've been supporting and giving money and giving offerings. You see, they were going to destroy the reception. And Jesus appeared after four days. Martha and Mary ran. And the Bible said, Mary fell down and worshipped. Are you offended? Do you get offended? Do you get angry? Do you criticize? The Bible never tells us where Jesus was the four days. Eh? You see? Have no idea. You have no idea the life that we are called to and the price we pay. You have no idea. If you are going to learn to receive... And you're going to have encounters that will bring healing. Encounters that, you see, one of the first things is to remove negativity so you can receive. I started by showing you Abraham and Melchizedek. I've gone ahead to show you some of the things that Charlie can derail the power of God from coming to your life. Because the greatest thing is to be able to receive. Clear the things that destroy your reception. Remember, there's a man sent from God. There are people in our midst. There are people who are coming away. They may look ordinary, but they're on a divine mission. They are human but they're not limited by humanity. At the time, they will sit down like Israel. They sleep and they faint and they hunger. They may be on the same ship with you when the storms are coming and they will be asleep. They sleep like you. Sometimes they sleep and they snore, but they are men of God. They also get hungry, but they are men of God. They don't wear the right clothes, but they are men of God. You see, the world has gradually shifted and we are trying to identify men of God by their clothes, their perfume, their cars. Listen to me. It's more than that, though. It's more than that. I pray that I will never be judged on the outward. I pray that your relationship with me will never be on the outward. Their childhood may be known from their mother's wombs. And unfortunately, it may create disrespect and create familiarity and dishonor. And all of a sudden, they cannot do mighty works. Do not shut the door to your life. Because what you see about him will determine how you behave towards the man of God. They have paid a great price of denying themselves. Taking up the cross to follow Jesus. Learn to receive them with honor and appreciation. When you encounter them, what they carry and deposit is a lifetime experience. 
the world will try to frame them up and destroy many with their human limitations and false accusations. But remember, but as many as receive them. Matthew chapter 7 verse 6. Matthew chapter 7 verse 6. What does it say? Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. You see, there are a lot of things that will help many of us. But God will not cast things that are precious before you. When things that are precious are given to you, value them. The man of God is a valuable thing. God will not give that which is holy unto the dogs. So if you have a certain attitude like a dog or a swine, you see, you find out that a lot of good things from God will not come to you. Because God does not cast his pearls, his precious things before people who treat them lightly. Everybody serving, Charlie, serve in a way that is pleasing to God. You find out that God's pearls will start coming before you. God's holy things will be given to you. And I've studied a lot of churches. I've studied great churches. And I've studied churches that are not doing well. It's just that people have learned to receive valuable things. And they treat them well. Do you treat the presence of God well? How sacred is the presence of God to you? How important is the presence of God to you? How do you behave in the presence of God? Do you come anyhow? No. Do you come angry? Do you come... Do you serve with some reverence? Is it holy? Is it precious? Is it good to come before a man of God? Do you recognize us? You see, when you are growing, there are mysteries you must learn. And there are people God has sent your way. He will not cast his spells before swine, nor give holy things unto dog. And a prophet is not without honor except in his own country. Sometimes you send somebody and somebody is angry. Somebody who may be around you gets angry. and uh, uh, It's more than that. We are human, but we stand as Israel. Change your life. The apostle says, we make many rich. As many as received, as many as received, to them gave he power. Just because they were able to receive, their life was going to be transformed. And as we grow, one of the things that is key is honor. By the grace of God, one of the things that my wife and I have learned is, there's a difference between me as a husband. As my husband, I'm, I have plenty faults. But when I stand here, I'm not a husband. If you want to be blessed, you've got to be able to transition and shift and recognize that this is a man sent from God. His name is John. And there's a reason why men of God are celebrated. Because you celebrate the price they've paid, the years they've stood, the persecutions they've suffered, the denials they've gone through. And he says, your house shall remain desolate till you shall see. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So there's a blessing that is coming your way. It comes with recognizing men of God. Don't be casual. Mm. Don't be indifferent. Don't joke with that. It's a holy thing. I could tell you about the widow who met Elijah. Charlie, she, her eyes are to open up to recognize that, Charlie, I'm broke, I'm poor, I'm about to die. But I can recognize and honor a certain man. And all of a sudden, my life is going to change. Because God comes into your life with his people. God is sending people who will totally change and transform your life. Never casualize the presence of God through a man. Abraham had to recognize Melchizedek. May God open our eyes to receive and so we can become what he wants us to be. Hello, precious one. We wish to extend a warm invitation to you to join us for any of our Sunday services at the PMI King's Temple. Our services are specially designed to specifically meet your needs and draw you closer to have fellowship with God in his presence. You are welcome to join us in person at 6.15 a.m. for the morning glory service, at 7.30 a.m. for the second service, which is also streamed live across all our social media platforms, and at 9.45 a.m. for the third service. We also wish to invite you to join us for the Living Mana, our weekday Bible teaching service, which comes off every Tuesday at 6 p.m. and Thursday at 6.30 p.m. in person and online, respectively. On Fridays, we gather before our Father's altar at 6 p.m. to pray and seek his face for divine encounters. The King has a special place for you. Don't come alone. You surely will be blessed by the word of God. In Jesus' name, God richly bless you. Thank you for listening to Rhema Power with Reverend Me Bernard Adiakwa. We hope you've been blessed. For further information, contact 0303-931-841. Tune in next week for another insightful teaching on Rhema Power.